So thank you so much. Um, so I guess the question that I am dying to ask is, um, how did you find the people uh, who were in this? Um, I've been doing yoga for about 14 years at the center on 13th Street, which is kind of um, a crossroads of the world, especially for the gay community. And um, meeting all of these people there, I was really struck by the incredible diversity of, of the community and the people that go there. And um, it kind of forced me to think about what it was that I was really interested in, and it's, it was people. What, what's more interesting than people? And they, there are so many different kinds of people that go there. And through friends that I had there, teachers, other people that I met, um, we met friends of friends, friends of friends of friends, and so on. And um, I started to become very excited about the, 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 a canvas, a very large canvas that I could create. And uh, I was excited by the diversity of people. And I just, I love making a movie where you have a state senator and a, a porn director and a, <laughs> um, a um, you know, a street kid and a 81-year-old uh, painter. It's, uh, I found that exciting. So it, basically from there, that, that was kind of a starting point, I, I guess. And it really did. I mean, when, when I came into it, from, that was probably a year, a year into your doing sit-down interviews with people. Draper had done a number of sit-down interviews with people from really across, across the spectrum. And part of that was seeing how people were on camera, and, and part of that was, was sort of getting, getting stories, seeing, um, seeing sort of where people came from. And it really is, I think one of the, the lovely things about this film is that it's not, um, it, it's not Manhattan within a very certain prescribed boundary. Um, it really is people from, from all across, from the five boroughs, um, and, and really a remarkable mix of people um, who might not um, who might not have ways of crossing otherwise and it and these the, the people who who ended up in the final film um, are, are are truly remarkable and there were a lot of really remarkable people who who went through the process and and but these were the ones ultimately that he decided to follow in this very in this very intimate way and that it takes a big commitment to be in a, a film like this. Yes, doing all those uh, interviews was kind of like auditioning, because mm -hmm. you found out who the people who were who were really the most sort of um, giving of, and generous with themselves, and I think that's that's who we found, who Draper found through this process. It, it was a challenge to find a balance of, of people too. I think because we, we found so many incredible people. People are still coming up to us and saying, you know, I got this cousin in the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got everybody for your movie yet? Because he's really, really interesting. And we're like, yeah, we, we got it. But it, it was trying to, to get a, a balance that was mm -hmm. difficult. Um, so I also want to encourage people from the audience, if you want to ask a question, there's microphones on either side. Jump in. And yeah, feel free to jump in. Sure. There's microphones. <laughs> you can use, oh, well, either the, way. There's an fine. audience yeah. microphone. <laughs> hey, this is um, wonderful. What a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Director. Um, I, I sat here very moved because I'm 45 years old and it, is inconceivable that a documentary exploring identity and challenges and personal existence as in gayness would ever not include AIDS in my lifetime, you know, as, as a backbone. 
any other documentary would have had it. We had it mentioned briefly with T and her sisters. But, but the idea that now that that imminent threat, that, that bullet to the head is diminished, we're left with the same issues of depression and suicide and glory and family and all that. It was just fascinating to see that. But there are also issues of, of power and identity. Did you have any struggle as a gay white man commandeering these stories from people who are facing challenges as you filmed them eating, which is incredibly intimate, a lot of food. Um, <laughs> but, but did you ever sense anyone editing themselves? Or maybe the opposite happened. They wanted to share, because this was a... No, that's a different one. Um, le le let me first uh, say we realized uh, from the very beginning we couldn't represent everyone. <laughs> you know. Okay. Yeah, that's got it. Um, <laughs> we we couldn't we couldn't represent every, everyone, and and we didn't really try. Um, so I went, and then I think other films, other documentaries have explored AIDS, gay marriage, yeah. and they, they, because their whole world. My point is it was a relief to see mm -hmm. that's not, a queer city can happen without the. Without that particular narrative. I have to go take my meds, la 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 la, which, you know. Which I do daily, by the way. I was yeah. before. Well, for many of us, yeah, of a certain yeah. generation, it's yeah. true. You you thought, would would we ever not have that in our lives? So that that's part of what we wanted to do with this project is make um, a modern film about now and about looking into the the future, thinking about the future, and uh, and things are changing very very rapidly. Um, talking about the different, do I feel as a white man, um, uh, th this whole, uh, this whole project for all of us um, was and is such a journey and uh, a really wonderful journey because when we started this, um, you really don't know what you're going to find. You know, I, I was interested, as Henry said, from the very beginning, we would do these talking heads with, with people and they would give you, it would give you kind of a one-on-one, -on -one, 101 of their story and it helped us gauge um, how complicitous they would be with the project to do it. But um, yeah, it, it was a, a great adventure. I knew nothing about making porn movies mm -hmm. and, um, uh, Haitian food, which I love, by the way, and just, yeah, all, all kinds of stuff. I think a lot of credit goes to Draper for his, his style of yeah. engaging people. Um, you don't come on as, as a person who's going to, you know, well, let's get the story and then, you know, you'll never see them again. You know, there's a, there's a kind of, you know, a development of kind of certain kind of friendship. And I also don't think you, I don't think you can, um, you know, we tend to think that, oh, people are, are, are going to be very close to us, but it's amazing how much people really feel the need and the desire to tell their story. And I think uh, that just obliterates um, all kinds of racial, class, gender lines all the time. And I think, and, and Henry, if, if you don't know, Henry Chalfont was, was um, is perhaps best known career long for um, Style Wars, um, which was really the, the landmark um, New York film um, about the graffiti artists um, in New York when no one else was even looking at this and considering this as fine art. And, um, you know, it's certainly, I, th I think, Draper certainly turned to, to Henry's wisdom a lot about sort of immersing yourself mm -hmm. in other people's worlds and not only 
um, helping you know, them sort of the, the comfort on both sides. And that well, one of the things we found, um, and one of the, the characters in particular who was a great talker, um, and at, at some point I said, you know, the, the fact is nobody has ever asked her her story right. before. Right. Um, she's got so much story to tell and no one has ever asked. Mm -hmm. And this is a, she sees this as a great opportunity to get her, to get her history, to leave her mark. Yeah. Um, and that's a, it is a, it is a great opportunity on both sides. And I think all of the, all of the people who participated um, have in, in retrospect, um, been happy, been happy they did it and are incredibly, you know, grateful f to Draper for for you know providing providing them the forum to do it. Uh, I also want to thank my producers, Town Coates and um, Henry Chalfant, and our story consultant, Chris Brennan, um, who gave me so much um, support and freedom to, to pursue all this. So, thank you. And I wanna, I wanna shout out to the, to the you know, aesthetic and artistic uh, gifts of our director who made this so appealing to watch, the choices that he made as, as editor, you know, and as you know, director. Um, really made a beautiful film. Thank you, and Henry was one of the DPs. Yeah, I was. <laughs> on it we were. Well. If you want to know what executive producer means in this instance, it was. <laughs> well, we bought half a camera, you know. Right, we, exactly. And we went out and started shooting, you know, which that's the that's the most fun part at the of it all. And of course, you you're always trying to learn, and you know the new equipment, different things, and and you make mistakes and everything. But that's that's how we began. And, uh, you know, then of course, you know, you've got to think about raising money after that. Now, what's interesting too, you asked about the, the straight white man and access and the, and the food, the eating at, at T's house. Um, you know, Draper had the brilliant idea. We had a, uh, our DP was an old friend of mine who's a, a straight white man, but he's a very engaging guy and, and uh, is a wonderful cinematographer. And we got him on board around the time we were, you know, thinking of doing this dinner uh, at, at T's home. And uh, Draper said, let's just leave Mike in there with them. <laughs> and we went off for an hour or two and just let him go. And it was a tiny little room, as you saw. And so he had no trouble making everybody feel at home in that room. Uh, first of all, I love documentaries, and this really was an extraordinary one, it seemed to me. I, I was Thank you. fully engaged, and, and particularly the, the balance between the interview and then the actual scenes. You just never were bored. I mean, you just never, yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, it made me think that if, we could, if there was one kind of film that we could have from the 16th century uh, about people, you know, who we are, you know, absent, you know, for most of history, uh, a film like this... Uh, the, the, the question I had uh, is simply this. Uh, there are so many wonderful scenes in it, but the one that I, I know a lot of people won't forget is the, uh, the, the one on the bicycle with the porn star and, the, uh, and, the, and the, her friend. And uh, I mean, the, 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 the narrative going along with the, but how did that come about? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's, this is, um, first of all, I shot it and Henry was driving <laughs> the car. And in, with all of these people, we were, we were always looking for excuses for B-roll footage, because we had these great interviews, but it's like you can't just sit there and listen to them. W you know, what's your life like? What do you do? And I knew that Mr. Pam and her current boyfriend um, at that time, uh, Raphael, were big bike riders. And I thought, oh, that'd be fun. We can like, get you on your bikes. Would you like to do that? And they said, yeah. So we started out. We're uptown. They're on their bikes. And the further we came downtown, more of their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and by the time we got to Christopher Street, 
they were down to, you know, bra and slip and. And that was just then. I mean, you had. That was yeah. just then, and uh, you and notice they were. The same thing happens with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, but they got you, they started out on two bikes, and then around Christopher Street, yeah. she had a flat tire, <laughs> and it, that didn't stop him at all. They <laughs> hopped on the other, by, and by that time it, it was just a circus, and we thought, <laughs> we're getting this, you know, <laughs> and we're driving around, and there's a lot of outtakes <laughs> in there. We couldn't include everything. Uh, tourists were. Uh, yeah, they were excited and flummoxed and... Why'd they come to New York? Everything. Oh, nice. Yeah, <laughs> they, they loved it. It was good. I'm glad you liked it. Well, I love the film. I think it's really beautiful. Um, I'm not surprised that it was. Um, two things. One thing, I really noticed that what seemed like one of the big sub-themes of the movie that emerged was really how the city's change so much, like the city itself, not just queer city, but it felt like so much of this was about how the world of this city is changing so much. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. And my other question would be also about the use of music. Uh, well, for, for those of us who have lived here a long time, it, it certainly has changed a lot. Um, um, it, it, just some of that is, is reflected in, in the film. Um, um, I, I don't know, were there parts in particular that made you think of like all New York or? You know, it was just sort of, sometimes they would just pass places and I'd be like, oh, that's not there, it's changed very much anymore. Yeah. And also one of the things about that all the people had in common is that most of them were not wealthy New Yorkers. And I thought that was also a really interesting thing about it. So that's also what made me think about it and thinking how these people or all of us who are not in certain echelons are being squeezed, you know, will be squeezed out eventually. So I guess there was a melancholy or it was almost a, lo um, a wistfulness about how much longer this world will be there, which made me think about the changing city, I guess. Well, these are a lot of stories that I, I don't think you would normally hear at all. Um, and, and a lot of people that are, um, you know, very, very comfortable. Um, um, I, I don't always know that their lives are that interesting. Um, maybe it, in some respect, but um, these, these people, th they, they spoke to me on some level. I, I thought they were fascinating, but they're, for a lot of them, um, especially as it goes further and further into it, they're, they, they are struggling here. And it's not just their orientation, it's m many, many things that impact them. Um, you ask about the music. The the music is by um, Eve Barzillay, who is uh, an Israeli composer, who um, I found him through his agent in L.A. and I, I wrote her a letter, uh, kind of explaining what I was looking for, and I I didn't want to use um, synthesized music. You know, I I wanted. Um, acoustic, uh, and um, I wrote this very long letter. You know, these are examples of what I like. Blah 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 blah. And she came back with two people, and he was the first one. And he, it turns out, he live lives in Nashville, which is where I'm from. And I thought, wow, this is <laughs> this is interesting. So. We went there to record the music, and uh, it, was, it was very interesting. He's a great guy. He's very talented, and he he wrote all of this for it, and um, that's him singing, and he scored all this as well. And I think there was a real there was a sensitivity toward, um, and I think part of Draper's sort of musical vision of this was something that was very rhythmic um, because you have that sort of rhythm rhythm of the city um, you know accompanying these personal stories um, 
Tell them about how we found the tap dancer. Oh, right, and the tap dancer and the drummer that you see in some of those those um, interstitial shots, um, and that was that was us, you know, walking down, uh, walking down the street one evening and passing by, you know, the old music store, which is on the Music Inn, yes, um, and there was a guy out front on a, you know, with a piece of plywood who was tap dancing, and he was being accompanied by a drummer. It was one of those sort of you're just walking by, and this is going on on the summer night, and we're we're walking past and and of course then I realized that Draper is no longer walking here and that he's you know he's stopped and is is going back to, to wait until they take a little break and said you know can I could I come back one day I'm doing this you know I think what you're doing is it's such an interesting sound it really got my attention could I come back and record sound and they said sure of course and it progressed from there from recording sound to you know, filming them and doing a doing a whole sort of recording session um, of the sound and and visuals as well. But so they they from from just like taking a break from the music store they worked in out on the street, um, that they ended up as as these sort of you know great New York characters in this film. So how long did it take to make this? Um, we shot on and off for about four years. Um, wow. Uh, some of the subjects in it um, were, we had already accumulated a lot of material on them and they were great and we wanted to use them. And then sometimes they just weren't available. Uh, Tom Duane was going out of office uh, around that time and uh, we, I, I already had committed to him that I, I really wanted him in the film, but we had to wait for months mm -hmm. to, to get to his office and shoot, shoot a lot of stuff, so. And, and truly, as I always say, the average documentary is seven years from beginning to end, so if we came in at five, we were way ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So yeah. oh, um, it really feels like uh, these people were telling their own story, and there was um, I, didn't, I didn't see that there was a lot of um, narration, or it was really just the people talking on their own. And I'm wondering how much of, um, of what happened was something that you predicted or that you kind of wanted to happen, and how much of it was organic um, that happened over the course of uh, making the film. It was all organic because um, when you do something like this, you, you don't really know what you're going to get. And the only thing we really had to judge by were the initial talking heads of the subjects to get a, a general sense of their story and who they were and how willing they would be to be in this. And um, so a lot of things like we we didn't know what we were going to get, you know we would <laughs> we would su suggest a bike ride for somebody and it it turns into you know the circus on the street. So and just in the same way that that um, Jeffrey had mentioned in his interview about working with the Alzheimer's patients, that that became that became a real destination, um, and that center could not have been could not have been better. And had you know was the families everyone everyone you saw uh, everyone everyone did their did their releases the families were very much involved were perfectly willing to have to have people to have their family members involved in this and so but that's something that that grew out of um, you know Jeffrey just mentioning it in the interview that this was volunteer work he was doing with Alzheimer's patients. Um, T, for example, I had no idea um, about her story, about her family, her catastrophic loss. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting there when she's telling that and hearing for the first time that she had lost five members of her family to AIDS. And uh, I, I'd never heard that before. It was, I mean, yeah. 
It was a, um, a journey. Mm -hmm. Were the um, mothers of the twins present when you were interviewing them? Like, were they uh, when they were talking about? No, it was, they it was, were not. It was, <laughs> and they were, and that yeah. was very, and it's it's so it's, interesting because my touching. expectation, Draper and I were there, were there together, and um, did the the interview. The interview area was set up down in their basement, and I fully expected here we are, you know, like two. You know, two middle-aged men who, and they, you know, the, the mothers had, had, I mean, they'd, they'd known Draper before. That may have been the first time they both met me. Um, and they, we said, you know, do you want to sit in when we interview the kids and did them, interviewed the kids separately? And they said, no, they're fine. Um, so they were, and those kids were, as you saw, incredibly self-possessed. <laughs> And they were um, they were terrific, and and um, they and they've the the whole family has seen. I, actually, maybe Leah hasn't seen it yet, but the the family has seen it, and um, and they they loved it, and and the fact that they've raised they have raised those two kids to say what's on their mind, and they absolutely do. Any more questions? Well, we thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.